Okay, here's more than anyone would ever want to know about the uh, internal workings in the apron of an early Axelson light. <laughs> but if you have one, this might come in handy. Okay, now the, <clears throat> the hand wheel rotates here and see it'll move the carriage. Okay, this is... Uh, Hand wheel rotates this shaft, this pinion. Now, the uh, clutch here for the longitudinal feet also hooks up to this gear. So I'll pull this gear off, if I can. It might not want to. Let me try to get this out first. And we will. Try to work that out. Uh. Well, I'm gonna have to jump up here and see what will come out. Oh, I got a washer jump back there. That's that's what it is. I just gotta hold the thrust washer. <laughs> okay. See the thrust washer got hung up. Okay, here's the pinion that uh, runs the rack. You should just step back in there real good. See that? Runs the rack. And <clears throat> it also... Um, is connected to um, the uh, longitudinal clutch, okay? So... Okay, I'm going to pull that out again. Okay, now, <laughs> one of the first video, I would I cranked the carriage all the way over, and I, lo I had lost motion. And what ha happened at the same time as this clutch bummer is going on is it sheared a pin. And I just replaced the pin here, just a straight 3 16 inch pin that holds that on there. And when I got this off, I noticed that it had been replaced before because they <laughs> drilled a hole in another place. So this uh, pinion that runs the rack has been replaced. Pretty sure. Okay. Now this is the bevel gear here. And when, when it shifts over, then the feed rod drives this gear. Put that over. Then, then uh, in the middle. Then see, when this is rotating, it rotates both um, the clutches here, the longitudinal clutch and the cross feed clutch. And then the levers push these clutches in, push those discs in, same here, and uh, that's how they actuate. So what happened here, uh, maybe at the same time they replaced the, the, the pinion for the rack, they replaced this gear. And this is a newer gear and it's not really compatible without some modifications in making spacers with the original piece, this one. So I had to, what it did was it bottomed out the return spring and instead of the clutch faces engaged, it a coil bound return spring worked the cross feet for some time until it broke the bearing because it's just not designed to work that way. So I put all the stress on the return spring that separates these things and the bearing that I replaced. See, the old bearing wouldn't do that. Okay, and I, I got it space so it'll work. Um, it's nice to, uh, when you're working on something like that, to have everything else out and uh, just work on that, that piece. Then once I got that set up, I got uh, the longitudinal clutch uh, worked fine all along, and I checked it, 
it looks good. So now I got to finish cleaning up this stuff and go over everything again and get it clean and uh, put it back together because I think I'm ready to go. Okay, it's really a pretty simple uh, mechanism. Okay, I will be back, hopefully with good news. Okay, now we're looking down into the apron and uh, this is the uh, longitudinal clutch. And the way it works is there's this cam here and this uh, part of a thrust bearing housing that rides on there. So when you take uh, one of these very heavy levers and, and put on here, so I got a key like that. And then when you actuate it, you can see that cone go in. Okay. Now, the longitudinal feed it is great on this. It has a bearing here and, and then that uh, angular contact bearing there. And if you look down on this, you see, get it even, this cross feed housing is shorter. So it doesn't have that extra bearing right here. It's just got the uh, one, two, three bearings uh, to hold it. So they, they changed it on later machines. And I think this is going to be okay, but it's just something you have to be aware of and uh, not jam the clutches and <clears throat> have it adjusted so it's not over, um, over torquing itself and causing problems. Now I got this working good here. I, I got it spaced out so it's not crowding that oil pump roller and it's not rubbing on the housing like it was. <laughs> so I got a little bit of gap down there. You can see maybe it's because the gasket kind of balled up down there and I got to be sure and fix that before I put this together. All right, now I mentioned I had this cranked all the way over. I was cleaning up the, the cast iron chips and then I could rotate the wheel and it wouldn't go anywhere. And I was having problems with these clutches too. And then everything gave out, but that was just a shear pin um, on the pinion for the rack. And um, I got, I just made a, a better pin for it and got it, uh, well, a better one that's not sheared, but a little larger diameter and tighten that up. Okay, so I'll, I'll get back. I'm gonna uh, get further and get this thing together here. Okay, I got this thing back together and uh, that was quite a job. Um, I think I got about 16 hours of hard labor into that. But I'll tell you what, you buy an old machine like this, for the cost of $5,000 and it breaks, you kind of get a little motivated to see if you can't fix it. And this uh, old machine is really simple and it's really pretty easy to fix. It had some mismatched parts and all it needed to be done was just shorten this and put a spade in that. And I just had to re uh, shorten the return spring and uh, make up some spacers because of the replacement gear for a later model is shorter. And it caused that rear bearing that broke to come halfway out of the bore and the adjusting threads on the adjuster here to protrude almost all the way. I mean, it was really messed up and the clutch itself was not engaging. It was uh, binding up the return spring and then the bearing broke and, and it was binding up that broken stuff and, and the clutch actually weren't jamming that stuff together for a while. But it, <clears throat> it was a mess that when, when you weren't using like the cross feed, it would catch 
every now and then with that junk floating around. So I'm topping up the oil here, and uh, I'll show you how um, I adjust this thing. And uh, I, I think you can make some mistakes adjusting some of these machines. Let's get that up there. How's that looking on the gauge? No, I taking this thing apart and you look inside to see how the oiling system is and you can see that it's best to have the oil up all the way to the top of the gauge because it gets picked up by the bevel gear goes and flows down the slope side of it to a little pinion and oils the other gears that are connected so on on this one uh, the oil level is quite sensitive so i just top that up and that's good for now. Okay. There's a cup here. And when it's totally full, it, it goes above. Uh, it fills the window totally up. Okay. So I adjust these. These uh, levers and cams are like really powerful. And you can over adjust them. So when you pull it in, it gets real tight and, and it goes, but it's under more stress than it needs to be. And noticing the weakness in this, uh, it's best to adjust it so there's just enough clutch engagement to do the job you want to do. And if you need a little more, you can adjust it a little tighter. Because the tighter you have that adjustment, the more stress it puts on everything. Okay, I'm going to start it up and, and show you what I'm talking about. Then I'll have to yell, okay? Here we go! And uh, 
It's oil in the cross slide. And it also oils the compound rest ways. Two little holes. Pretty amazing. But I tell you what, that's what took the longest was cleaning out those plugged uh, oil channels. Now if you got an axis <laughs> It might be a good idea to take, uh, you got to take the rear gib loose back here and then there's six carriage bolts and you can jack it up from both sides and clean this stuff out like the top of this here gets just packed with uh, stuff inside the V here. There's quite a space. And then here too, the little oil channel um, get plugged up. So uh, it might not be a bad idea to uh, take the carriage top off. Now, now that leaves the problem with stabbing the uh, carriage uh, lock bolt back in. And all it does is go into a T-nut, a 5 8 coarse thread T-nut that's ground a little narrow uh, where the bolt goes in so it fits. So if you don't have that part, you can make one out of a 5 8 T-nut real easy. Now, on that, what I did, because I had the carriage top up, the uh, lock nut sits, uh, is right above the uh, half nut. So I had the half nuts open, and that's how you have to do it when you put the front of the carriage on too. That uh, actuator cam will uh, snap right in and make it easy to stab in. But I put a piece of uh, paper towel uh, on top of the half nut, then laid the nut for this on top of it and was able to stab that in. So I kind of worked on it so it was, you know, the nut, the nut, the screw in the nut would start easy and it worked. Otherwise, uh, you're going to have to get into the apron, pull the front of the apron off and get that uh, nut in there. Oh, right. Right back running again. And, uh, I have a whole bunch of projects to do on this, and I have those chucks to fit and grind and all kinds of stuff that I think you might find interesting. Uh, this was sort of a side trip. I really wasn't planning, but I knew I had to do it. I, uh, I watched uh, one of Kimber Zellick's videos, and uh, he had to do the same thing on his Pratt & Whitney leg. So it, it's not an easy thing to do, but it's not real hard to do but it, it's really time consuming. It does take time to do that. And, uh, well, anyway, I'm going to be back on the projects. I'll tell you what, I think it sounded a little bit quieter. Not getting too hot back here where I adjusted the spindle bearing. Oh, my goodness. This machine saved the day too. Fabulous. 1983 Monarch 10 believe That is for sale. Okay, I will be back.